All right. Today we're talking with Army veteran Jim Donnelly, CEO and co-founder of Restore Hyper Wellness. Their mission is to make proactive wellness solutions accessible and affordable to everyone. Since its inception, Restore Hyper Wellness has grown to over 80 stores across the country and in 2020 delivered its one millionth service. Under Jim's leadership, Restore is currently on track to have 150 open stores by the end of 2021 and will achieve new record revenue. Jim, welcome to the show. Let's get started by going back and telling us what you did in the Army. Yeah, hey, Joe, thanks for having me. So, um, you know, I, I say my, my military career probably started the day I was born. I was born into a military family. My father is a retired Army officer. Every male in the Donnelly family going back hundreds of years has been in the military in some form or fashion. Okay. So I didn't really have a choice. Um, Having said that, my dad also said to me early, you're going to college and I'm not paying for it. And so um, ROTC became a really good way for me to you know, pay for school. So, um, so, so for me, I always knew I was going to be in the military. Um, and so I, I, I went to school, did the ROTC thing, came out. I was a quartermaster officer, went to airborne school, went to ranger school, um, came out. Um, my first duty station was in Korea on the DMZ. So that was sort of an interesting life experience. One that I grow fonder and fonder of the farther I get away from it. <laughs> um, and then came back um, to Hunter Army Airfield where um, we supported a Ranger Battalion um, and did that for a couple of years. And then had the opportunity to get out a little early um, so I spent a total of almost, I guess, about four years on active duty and, and during the Clinton administration had the ability to get out a little early and, um, and took advantage of that. Um, and so I, I guess I was a little different when I did ROTC, I wanted to control my life a little better. So I crammed my MBA and my undergrad into the four years. And so I was an army officer that had my MBA already. Wow. And so that helped with the transition. I'll also say I saw my dad go through it. And so I saw my dad have a you know 25 year military career. He loved the military more than anything. I actually think he lost his, his sort of center when he got out of the military and never really found anything to replace it. Right. But he came out and was, a, was sort of a wacky entrepreneur. He tried, you know, 10 different things. And I saw him fail a couple of times, bankruptcies, things like that. Um, but he never lost his enthusiasm. He never lost his spirit. So for me, I sort of saw that. I saw what that transition looked like. I made sure I did things a little different, focused on my education. Um, and then when I was ready to get out of the military, I was, I think I was much better prepared for the transition. Awesome. Yeah. I've often said that um, the thing I miss the most about the military is the military mindset being around that military mindset all the time. And the closest thing I've found to the military mindset is the entrepreneur mindset. Yeah, for sure. It's, you know, it's in, in the military is different in a lot of ways. Like I, I'm married to a West Point grad. And so, you know, Stacy, you know, she went to West Point and she's like, man, the military is full of high speed. Everybody's awesome. Everyone's a hard charger. And then she went to her first duty station and said, oh, wait a minute. This isn't exactly like West Point. <laughs> and so um, you got pockets of, of different mindsets, I think. I think, you know, if you're in a combat arms unit, you've got sort of one mindset and, and it takes you down one path. If you're in a support, you, you, you know, um, unit and doing mm -hmm. the quartermaster thing, the transportation thing, it's a little different. Um, you know, I, I chose quartermaster because I did have my MBA and I thought it'd be the most applicable to the business world. And um I, I probably never had ambitions to be a 20 year retired army officer. I, I wanted to go check the box, serve my, you know, serve my country, fill my commitment. But, you know, I, like I said, I was thinking about that transition from the beginning. Uh, so what were some of the things that you went through in your transition? Did you, did you like, did you jump right into entrepreneurship or did you just land yeah. in a safe job? Well, it's funny. Um, when I got my MBA at the University of Georgia, they had an entrepreneurship track and I took that. And so I started a company um, in college and, and I started a company that that grew pretty rapidly. We had offices in Europe. We had offices in the States. I was living in Europe, um, actually, when the military called me and said, Jim, 
you got two choices. We come and get you and that won't be pleasant or you come back, it's time. And, um, and so I'd, I'd had a taste of entrepreneurship um, you know, early on, even before the military. And I learned a lot from that because when I had to go into the military, I had to figure out a plan to take care of my business. And I chose poorly. I hired a guy. He ended up stealing all the money from the bank accounts one day and never saw him again. And I was literally in ranger school when that happened. So the last thing that they want to hear in ranger school is, hey, my business, you know, just had all the money stolen and my family depends on it. I've got to go take care of that. And so they did accommodate me and they did, you know, let me do that. But but I'd gotten a little bit of taste of entrepreneurship um, and I had tasted the good side of it. And obviously with that experience, tasted the bad side of it as well. So um, it, it kind of informed what I did after the military a little bit. So um, I guess when I went out, I, I you know, I, I went through one of the traditional military recruiting services. Um, I forget the name of it, but it was one of the top two. And I was unique once again, because I had my MBA and I had had some business experience. And so it was, it was pretty easy for me to get a job. I, I, I had a choice between Procter & Gamble, Frito-Lay, and Kraft Foods. And I chose Kraft Foods. And I was a brand manager for Jell-O Pudding and Cool Whip. So a very funny transition from supporting a Ranger Battalion to you know, marketing pudding and Cool Whip. And yeah. my friends didn't let me live that down for a while. Um, but it was all about, for me, getting a pedigree in the civilian world. And, and, I, and I, I swore to myself, I'll never put myself in a position again where I don't have something to fall back on. So it's always nice to be able to say you are a military veteran, you are a former army officer, people respect that. But okay, that's just the kind of get you in the door thing. So right. then I wanted to be able to say I'd worked at a series of blue chip companies. So I worked at Kraft to check the blue chip package goods marketing box. Then I went to work for AT&T to help set up a retail unit. So that was checking the retail um, box. Then I went to work at um, Coca-Cola and I developed new brands for Coca-Cola internationally. So that was to check the international box. And then I went to Citibank and ran a big global communication group. And that was partly to check the technology box and just partly to check the, I have now managed a lot of folks at a blue chip company, you know, on the civilian side. Mm -hmm. And then right about then it got me to 2001 and kind of anybody with a brain in New York city was starting an internet company. And so a buddy of mine at Citibank and I, we quit and we started this internet company called I go, you go about a month before nine 11. So it was an internet travel company. So the worst possible thing, number one, an internet company, number two, a travel company. Mm -hmm. And so ironically it forced us to have to figure out how to make it work without any money. And uh, four years later, we won a Webby Award as the top travel site in the US. And so I do credit some of my military experience to that. And I, number one, when shit hit the fan, we didn't panic. Um, number two, um, we, you know, we kind of took it piece by piece, broke the problem down, um, hired some really good people that had similar mindsets and didn't panic. And you, know, you, you kind of persevere and you push and push and push and you come out on the other side of it. And I think that's, that's certainly a military um, experience thought to be sure. Yeah. Just being able to, to survive a, anything in the travel business after September 11th. I mean, yeah. I, I was actually flying for the airlines when that happened and I was <clears throat> furloughed for seven years and ended up retiring from the, from the Marine Corps after it was all over with 13 years later. So. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, some, some of those things make you stronger and, and, and I always say a lack of options creates amazing clarity. And so 9-11 actually made it very obvious how we had to run our company if we were going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, that turned out to be a blessing. And, and even more importantly, when we then sold it to Travelocity, um, we owned 100% of it. So because we were inept at raising money and, and figured it out organically, when we had our exit, it was, it was much more personally fulfilling. Um, and we were in control of it. So some, sometimes the bad things have unintended positive consequences. So that's great. You actually ended up selling out to Travelocity. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I worked for them for a little bit in their venture group. Um, and, and it was great. Um, but I, I knew at that point, you can't go run a company like I go, you go and build a company and go back into corporate America. In my opinion, and that, that just wasn't an option for me. I couldn't, I, 
I, I rolled my eyes way too many times. And, uh, and Travelocity, by the way, great company, lots of good people. I'm not knocking them. I yeah. just were built to well, go back. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because that's come up many times is once you cross over into the, the realm of maybe you're, you're now an entrepreneur, um, yeah. people consider themselves unemployable. Like they can't, yeah. go back, can't go back into working for somebody else. Well, you know, the funny, I'll tell you a funny story. I was at a wedding when I was working at Kraft Foods uh -huh. and you know, they kind of pair up people based on who they are. So I get in the cart with the other entrepreneur. And so anyway, the guy's asking me, what do you do? And I said, well, I work at, at Citibank. Um, and he goes, okay, great. Um, what did you do before that? Well, I worked at Coke and before that AT&T. And finally he said, well, why the hell are you in my cart? I'm the entrepreneur. And I was told you were the entrepreneur. And um, I, I looked at him and said, man, you're right. I've kind of lost my way. I literally quit the next week. Um, and, and I was ready. I mean, it, it wasn't, I had been working on I Go, You Go, but it was kind of the last straw that made me get back to what I really wanted to do. I mean, corporate America is great. I was successful in corporate America. These were blue chip companies. Um, and I absolutely owe a lot of my current success to those experiences. When you go in an environment like a Kraft Foods, a Coca-Cola, you are around some of the best people in the world. You're yeah. around the best marketers and, oh, yeah. and you internalize way more than you think. Um, you take it for granted. And then 10 years later, when you're doing your own company, you fall back on all that pedigree and all that sort of institutional knowledge that you gained. And you don't have to think about it. You automatically can spit out better outcomes because of that experience. So, so I always, when, when military guys ask me, I'm like, man, go to the blue chip, go, go work at the great companies, not necessarily the one that pays you the most money. Um, it's just sort, sort of part of my advice, but. Awesome. Yeah. Great perspective. Hey Jim, uh, hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. All right. We're back talking with army veteran, Jim Donnelly from restore hyper wellness. So, Jim, talk a little bit about, I mean, you guys sold I Go, You Go to Travelocity, I mean, big, you know, the big acquisition. I mean, that's, that's every, well, maybe not every entrepreneur's dream, but I mean, that's kind of the cat's meow at some point, right? Um, talk a little bit about what your responsibilities are to Travelocity, having been acquired by them, and then what happened after Travelocity. Yeah, it's traditionally when you are the founder of a company and you build a company, when someone buys you, they're buying you and the idea. And so the idea that they're going to buy me and I can just walk away was a non-starter. So I had a, I had a year commitment where I had to work there and help the transition to, you know, bring, I go, you go into the fold. Um, and that was fine. Um, but I got to admit, I, it was not my cup of tea. So once again, I, I wanted to get out on my own and, and do other things. So when my, my commitment was done, I said, thank you guys. You've, you know, you've given me enough wealth to live the life I always imagined. And, I appreciate that, but I'm going to go do my own thing. And, um, I, you know, I think once again, being a military kid, uh, a military brat and an army officer, I was not sentimental about things. The day I sold, I go, you go, I was fine moving to the next thing. That, that was sort of the pattern of my life. Um, and so I did a variety of things. I, I had this philosophy that every five years I wanted to do something good for society, but also something I was interested in. So we started a men's grooming lounge in Charlotte where all the muckety mucks and CEOs in Charlotte would come. I started a real estate development company and bought these old cool bank buildings and sold the, you know, in one building, sold the top floor to Michael Jordan, sold the next floor to Cam Newton, sold the next floor to Daughtry, sold the next floor to Boris Diaw. And it was the coolest building in Charlotte. Um, and, and just did like things like that. I was, I, I loved the real estate dynamic. I loved the men's grooming lounge thing. I, I started a really high-end health club in Charlotte called the Charlotte Athletic Club with some buddies and just constantly sort of was looking for things I was interested in, but also good for society. And society could be grand society or my little world. And, and a lot of the Charlotte stuff was my little world. But, but one day I, um, I said, all right, I'm ready to go on to the next phase. And, and that's where I kind of ran into Restore. And so at that point, I was 46 years old. My body was pretty broken up. I was training for a triathlon with a buddy. He happened to be one of the founders of a venture fund. And so I said, man, I tell you what, I'm beat up. I got to go try this cryotherapy thing. So I went and tried it and it made me feel great, but I hated everything else about the experience. 
And so I called my buddy and I said, man, you've got to try this. And he laughed at me and said, that sounds stupid. So I finally, I buy him a package. I force him to go. He loves it. And he's like, all right, let's, let's do this. And so we said, worst case, we're going to have our own private cryotherapy studio and, and we can invite our friends. But what happened was it was a, a smashing success. So we took this thing that was good for you, but in a crappy retail environment, we created a really nice retail experience. We lowered the price so that it was affordable and accessible for everyone. And it took off like crazy. And so we then opened four or five more stores. We wanted to validate that we weren't just um, looking at a one-off anomaly. And then we started adding things that would make it defensible because anybody can open a crowd therapy studio. So we started adding these light touch medical things that required medical oversight and required a whole bunch more thought and systems and, and protections against anybody else being able to open it. And we woke up one day and we had a business that had 10 different services, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, cryotherapy, IV therapy, compression therapy, sauna therapy. I mean, go on a few others, but but now it was this fully integrated offering. It was um, medically regulated on, on for half of our services. So it was really hard to replicate. And we said, let's go get scale so that we can do things that our smaller competitors couldn't. And we are now the largest um, in the world for all of our modalities. No one does more IVs, cryotherapy, sauna, HBOT. We are the largest by far. And so we sort of use that scale to continue to add sophistication to it. We're spending millions of dollars on new technology now and all kinds of other stuff. And the, the foundation of that was we are a mission-based business, which once again, a, appeals to a military person. Yeah. Um, and our mission is to democratize what we call hyper wellness. Hyper wellness is the next level of wellness. We created that category, but the notion of democratizing it so that it's not just something rich people and pro athletes can afford. It's something school teachers, military people, everyone can afford. And the ironic thing is we have everybody. We, we have the Aaron judges and the Christian McCaffrey's of the world that come in and super rich people, but they're sitting right next to a fireman, right next to a school teacher, right next to a retired military officer, you know, and, and that's, what's cool about it. it. It is truly the democratization of wellness. So I've never heard of restore hyper wellness. I've never heard of cryotherapy, but I looked up restore hyper wellness right before we got on this, on this interview. There's one right here by my house and I, in Kansas city, it's actually Olathe and yeah. I've probably, I've probably driven by it 20 times. I know, I know the exact shopping center that it's in. I'm like, I'll be darned. Um, and, and by the way, that's the kind of shopping center we go in across the country. So a, a yeah. class A, there's usually a Whole Foods or some nice there grocery. Yeah. <laughs> and lots of yeah. nice other retailers that are complimentary. And, yeah. you know, the Kansas City Chiefs come in there all the time. And no kidding. it's really well known um, to the okay, folks. So yeah. You've touched on some of the things you guys do, but what exactly is cryotherapy? So cryotherapy is cold therapy. So you get into a fully enclosed chamber for three minutes at negative 260 degrees and you basically freeze yourself. And so when you do that, your really? body kicks in these defense mechanisms immediately um, because it thinks it's going to die. If, if, if you're in negative 260 degrees, your brain thinks this is a crisis. I've got to do certain things. Yeah. So the three minutes isn't arbitrary. The three minutes is the perfect amount of time for you to maximize the benefit without getting frostbite or anything like that. But, but your brain goes through a series of, of decisions and your body automatically kicks in some physiological things. And long story short, the, the main deliverable is that it reduces inflammation. And so when you think about reducing inflammation, that's the byproduct of hundreds of chronic conditions. 70% of Americans have a chronic condition. Most of them are inflammation-based. And inflammation problems lead to pain problems. So at the end of the day, we treat a lot of pain driven by inflammation. So yeah. I, I would say to you that having cut, sort of been through the military, you probably got some aches and pains. Go over and try cryotherapy three days in a row, and I my my treat, and I guarantee you, you will feel better than before you started. No kidding. Okay, so so is this like that one guy, um, like he's from Sweden or something, where he's he? Yeah, Wim Hof. Well, from huh, it's a similar concept, exactly. exposing yourself yeah. to those extreme cold temperatures yeah. to snap your body. Yeah. So, so think about this. Like we live in a state of homeostasis. We are in a, a home that's a temperature range. We got heat yeah. and air conditioning. It never varies much. 
we get into a car that's got heat and air conditioning, we, we bundle up, we go to an office, we sit in front of a computer, we keep our body in this sort of narrow band of homeostasis. That is not how bodies were designed. Bodies are designed to deal with stressors. And so whether it's hot, cold, pressure, a whole bunch of other things, it is good for your body to go through these different, you know, sort of um, reactions to stress. Um, so exercise yeah. is stress, by the way. So, mm -hmm. you know, too much exercise is bad. Too little exercise is bad, but exercise is a stressor that helps helps you get to a better place is, is important. So all of our stuff does that. Um, and, and then you got a world where 80% of people walk around in a dehydrated state. So we do IVs and, and, and we, we say everything we do is seminal. So there's a reason the first thing they do in a hospital is give you an IV when you go to the emergency room. Cold therapy, no one debates cold therapy. Every athlete's been in an ice bath. Everyone's put ice on a bad ankle. Yeah. We know yeah. cold therapy works. Saunas, saunas have been around for centuries. Hyperbaric therapy, pressure therapy has been around for decades. So everything we do is tried and true and proven. And one of the principles is that everything we do is backed by science and medical studies. Um, and, and another principle what we do is everything we do makes you feel better right away. So if you have proven things that work that make you feel better right away, you got the foundation for a really good business. No kidding. How do, how do you guys make that affordable? Once again, it's, it's scale. Um, you know, when you're the biggest at what you do, you can reduce the cost structure and then by extension, you can reduce the price. So mm -hmm. when we first started, for example, a cryotherapy session might be $70 for three minutes of cold. But, you know, if you have an acute situation, it's worth it. But we're trying to create this virtuous cycle of the more you do, the better you feel, the better you feel, the more you do. So you got to make it affordable. So we now charge around $25 for a member. So about a third of what it used to be. Um, and then people sort of look at it. Well, that's about the price of the coffee I drink in a week. And mm -hmm. I'm going to get rid of the pain that I'm having so that I can go be me again. That's an equation that I, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly do. Okay. So simple question. Can you get about the same effect by dunking yourself in an ice bath for about, ice, ice bath for about three minutes? Um, whether it's three minutes or a little longer, but absolutely cold therapy, whether it's cryotherapy or an ice bath, you're going to get, it's slightly different, but you're going to get some similar benefits. But now, it's like how many people are actually going to go do that? <laughs> uh, how many times have you done an ice bath in your house? It's a pain in the butt. It's yeah. messy. Hardly and by hardly. the way, it hurts. Anyone that's been in an actual ice bath, it is very, very painful. So it's the alternative is to hop in a cryo chamber that's not painful. It's three minutes. It's dry. Doesn't mess up your makeup. Um, doesn't get your you know water all over the place. So, um, but, but the response or the effect is the same. It's similar. It's similar. It's definitely similar. So no kidding. Yeah. I've never I've never heard of. I didn't realize somebody had already been doing this. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, the one modality we have you can't replicate easily is hyperbaric therapy because it's all about the pressure. So yeah. you can replicate the benefits of IVs by eating differently, by drinking more water and all that sort of thing. Having said that, um, anybody over 40 has a micronutrient deficiency of some kind. You know, like I said, close to 80% of the population walks around dehydrated. Oh, so yeah. even though you can replicate these things, you don't necessarily. So something like a restore you know, we have some blood tests. We'll tell you where you're off, what, what you need to fix. And then based on that, give you a personal protocol and you will literally feel better from the very first day that you come in. And, and that's been the secret. I've heard of people using uh, a lot of veterans are using hyperbaric therapy for traumatic brain injuries and things like that. But what, what are some, what's somebody using the hyperbaric chamber for yeah, traumatic, traumatic, brain in, traumatic brain injuries is the big reason why people mm -hmm. come in. We have veterans coming in every day, okay. concussions. Um, so if, if you if you have a concussion or a concussion issue, one of the first things you should do is get in the hyperbaric chamber. Um, and then some a lot of other things you, that have the to The hyperbaric do. chamber, sorry, um, with the hyperbaric chamber, do you take them up to, to a, a, a higher altitude or you take them down low? It's both? called atmospheres. So we go to like 1.3 atmospheres. And so um, that, that's a higher, higher pressure, higher altitude, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, that, that's the one thing you can't replicate. You can, like I said, you can go get in a hot, cold, you can eat a little differently, you can exercise differently, but it is, it's pretty hard to replicate this, this notion of, of more pressure 
And by the way, that pressure pushes um, red blood cells into parts of your body that don't necessarily get a lot of good flow around that. And you're also pumping oxygen into the chamber with the pressure. So not only are you pushing things into parts of the body that they that doesn't normally go to very well, but you're also doing that in a more oxygenated state. So you're getting more oxygenated cells, red blood cells, the parts of your body that need to heal. You know, once again, you think about inflammation. Inflammation sort of builds a blockage around a part of your body. So the blood flow to that area is less. And so whether it's a concussion or other things like, this helps with that problem. And so a lot of people come because they have early signs of Parkinson's. It helps with MS. Um, there, are, there are studies out there that say that it could potentially help with um, all, pushing off Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, it's one of the few things that studies have shown that potentially help grow telomeres. Telomeres are the ends of your cells that tell you how old you are from a biological perspective. So, so, you know, hyperbaric therapy is, is pretty cool. It does a whole bunch of really good things for you. And so what, are, so those are the two main things. What, what are some of the other things you guys are doing? In- well, cryotherapy and IV therapy are our two main things. So IV therapies, we put a bag of saline, we put um, um, micronutrients, vitamin C, D, glutathione, magnesium. And so once again, take, take a COVID world. Um, the, some of the biggest indicators of a bad COVID outcomes are you have a vitamin D deficiency, vitamin C, magnesium, zinc. So if you can get those things into your body in a way that's going to absorb it, you are better preparing yourself to potentially deal with the virus. And so what, what I always say is take the word coronavirus off of anything you're talking about and put heart disease, cancer, diabetes, all of these things that are killing thousands of people every year. Restore is designed to help combat those things and viruses and other things. So we're not making the claim that we can um, keep you from getting everything. But what we are making the claim is that if you do certain things, your body will be better prepared with better immunity um, to deal with the things that it faces. And, and that's when been go, part of it. When you go to the doctor or hospital and they hook you up to an IV, is their IV different than the ones you use? Do you have added nutrients and stuff in your IVs or is it just, is that what it is? is yeah, they're, 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 just, they're a little different. Like you go in the hospital, they're probably not putting vitamin D and vitamin C outside of the context of coronavirus. By the way, in the coronavirus world, those are things that they're putting in IVs. But um, typically they're just trying to get fluids into your body. This is the best way to, to you know, it's like drinking the equivalent of a gallon and a half of water, one saline bag. And then the micronutrients, the thing that's important is when you do them through an IV, you get 100% absorption. If you take those same micronutrients in a pill orally, the vast majority of that is not absorbed in your body. So it's just a much better way. But the hospitals put in nutri- are putting hydration in you, and they're probably putting medicine in that bag, um, things like that. So they're, they're, the difference between us and a traditional medical system is they are fixing you after you're sick. We are trying to keep you from ever getting sick. We're trying to push all that stuff out. Um, so ours is a proactive approach. Theirs is a reactive approach. By the way, traditional wow. medicine is great. We're not knocking traditional medicine. Right. Wow. That's awesome. I, I've, it's amazing. Um, you, how many stores are you up to now? 100, 150? Well, a little over 90. We're about 91. Um, so since, since you got the bio that said 80 in the mid 80s, we've opened another five stores. And so our goal is within three years to be within 15 minutes of 80% of the U.S. population. Uh-huh. Our goal over the next decade is to virtually be in all developed countries. So yeah. wow. um, it's, are, you a, are you a franchisable model? We're both. So we have corporate stores and franchise stores. So the last two years, we've been named the hottest franchise in America by Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur awesome. Magazine. Um, you know, every inch of America will be sold um, either as a corporate location or franchise location in the next year, year and a half. So it's been great. And um, we do, by, by the way, when we first started, the only franchisees we recruited were West Point grads. So we said, we want to go get the best of the best military folks, um, people who we knew could deal with the little things that came their way, followed orders really well. Um, we, we've since expanded our approach to recruiting our franchisees, but, mm-hmm. but there's a strong foundation of, of that. And, and, you know, my, my, once again, my wife was a West Point grad. Um, she 
was a high level athlete and, and ran track at West Point. I was a high level athlete in college. And so we were kind of beat up and, and it, it, it all kind of co coalesced at, at the right time. And, and, um, you, you know, being an entrepreneur depends on a few things. It depends on knowing your capabilities and, and, and sort of accentuating your weaknesses with people that are good at what you're not good at. It, it, it obviously, you know, creates the need for a decent idea an idea that fills a, a need in society in some way or another. But, but a lot of it is just perseverance and, and, mm -hmm. and holding on and, and not buckling at the first sign of this is hard. Um, so good idea, you know, good team, accentuating your weaknesses with people who are good at what you're not good at, um, and some perseverance and not obviously having enough capital and all those sorts of things. But but, um, you know, that's kind of the formula. And, and, and my favorite saying as an entrepreneur is always a lack of options presents clarity. Like when you only have certain options that you have available to you, go be good at those. Mm -hmm. Go take advantage of those. Don't try to do stuff that you can't do for whatever reason. And um, yeah, that, that's always been that's sort of how I've informed how I've built companies. Wow. That's awesome, Jim. Um, we're about out of time. I do want to give you a chance if somebody's interested in exploring Restore either as a customer or maybe they want to get involved in, in a franchise or from the business side of things, uh, how would they how would they get a hold of you or or Restore? Yeah, super easy. Go to restore.com and there are a variety of ways to um, to you know click on the info link and send us an email, or you can always send me an email, Jim at restore.com. And so super simple. Um, you know, we, we feel like we're changing the world. We feel like we're having a big impact on society. Um, and we're looking for great people to join the team. Um, we're desperately looking for full stack developers. We're desperately looking to hire great marketing people and obviously looking for great franchisees. That's awesome. Well, hey, Jim, thanks for sharing uh, your, your military and your corporate and entrepreneurial success story. And look forward to seeing the future success of Restore. Well, thanks, Joe. Thank you for having me. It was, it was fun. And um, if I can ever help with anything, let me know. And I, I am going to encourage you, go into the Aletha store, tell them I sent you, and, and they'll give you some free cryotherapy sessions. All I got to do is say, Jim sent me. I'm good. Say, Jim sent me. <laughs> awesome. You, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send them a little note, just letting them know that, that who you are and all that. So when you say I mean, that. Make sure it's just me, because like, I don't want all my buddies going there before I get there. And <laughs> I'll, I'll tell them Joe and I'll, I'll give them the back. I'll give them the backstory. So they'll, they'll be prepared for you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, thanks. Jim. Um, awesome. And uh, appreciate uh, sharing your story. No, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And thank you for what you're doing to try to help veterans. I really, really admire it and appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. All right. These two veterans are Oscar Mike.